So let me welcome you in to our Tools Behind Rolling Release Distro Meetup. My name is Kristina Streitova. I work at SUSE as a team lead of the packaging team, what is a team that is handling, um, I would say, thousands of packages in SUSE Linux Enterprise and in our open SUSE distributions, open SUSE Leap and open SUSE Tumbleweed. And Tumbleweed is the rolling distribution we will uh, today talk about. So in this meetup, we would like to um, discuss tools that we use for, for building and for testing uh, Tumbleweed. And it's uh, OBS, it's, it's open build service, uh, which is our build tool where we build basically everything. And then it's OpenQA, which is a framework for automated testing. And it helps us to uh, provide um, as stable as possible uh, Tumbleweed snapshots. Because we know that probably we, we can have like mixed audience here. Um, so we will try to uh, cover both parts. Um, like if, if you've never heard about those tools, we will try to, to try to give you some short introduction, what it is, why it's important and so on. But then we, we can also discuss your um, thoughts, your your ideas, your, your questions, your problems. So feel free to um, ask questions if you have any. You can do it directly via microphone. Just, just uh, ask for um, sharing your microphone uh, or you can put your questions to the chat and I will try to monitor the chat and bring uh, questions to our speakers. So when I'm talking about uh, speakers. So uh, we have currently here uh, Martin Puskal, who is a QA person of an open source enthusiast. He works also at SUSE. And we have also Chris Devan here, who is a free software enthusiast working on open QA, and they also work for SUSE. We have also a few other people in the audience here um, who have something, something in common with uh, OpenQ or OBS, or they at least work with that. So um, I think that um, uh, Dan Schermack should be here. He, he works it's a, as a software engineer on development tools. He's QA enthusiast and Linux distribution contributor. We have, uh, who else is here? Probably Lubosz Kotsman is here, uh, his release manager for OpenSUSE uh, Leap. And uh, he is also ex release engineer for HAL 6 and HAL 7. So he has a lot of experience with uh, various ec ecosystems. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, yeah, are also Veronika Švecová is here. Um, so she's a QA engineer. So she has a hands-on experience with OpenQA. So she can uh, discuss um, how, how it is uh, using OpenQA every day. So regarding the agenda, um, we split the whole session to two, three, two, three parts. So in the first part, we will start with a uh, rolling distro topic. So what it is, if you've never used rolling distribution. So we will try to cover that for you. What are the biggest challenges? Um, what is our workflow and so on? Then we move to OpenQA, uh, where uh, Chris will um, describe what it is, uh, why it's essential for us, and what are our development plans for it, for example. And the last topic will be OBS. Um, so uh, we will go back to Martin Puskal there, and uh, he will describe uh, how it works um, and how, how we build basically everything there. So during the whole session, feel free to ask. Um, and I think that uh, we can start. So I will hand it over to Martin Puskal. So, hello, I'm Martin. I'm working as a QA person in SUSE, and I'm also a long-term contributor to OpenSUSE, not only in the packaging, but also in some other areas like membership committee and so on. So I actually see some of the people here whose membership I, I approved, so that's nice. <laughs> and so what we are here to talk about is uh, rolling release distributions. What are rolling release distributions? My, I would say I would start with a story of or my background, how I got into rolling release distributions, how my addiction for a rolling release distribution started. Many, many years ago, I was just a junior Linux user and I was using things like Debian and I wanted the latest and coolest stuff and it was not really that compatible with using Debian. So I started to try to build some stuff on my own, but it was also not very convenient to rebuild everything and reinstall everything. 
and I was hitting more and more obstacles in the old tool chain on the stable release on, of Debian back then, like 15, 20 years ago. So that's how I got into using of the Gen2 Linux, which was pretty popular back then. And you build everything on your own and you have the latest, coolest stuff and yeah, you could just customize everything, how you how you liked it and so on, which was pretty cool. And uh, this this is some something that I kept doing or using for many years until I joined SUSE and I figured out that I don't have to rebuild everything that I can in instead just install OpenSUSE Tumbleweed at the cost of some some level of uh, loss of customizability. Obviously, if you are building everything from scratch, you can really fine tune what you are building, how you are building. You can choose the optimization level for your hardware and so on. But on the other hand, it actually saved me a lot of uh, a lot of electricity and a lot of, uh, lot of time spent, build, spent building packages. And I figured out that uh, if I don't like something in OpenSUSE, I can just easily change it to the way that it works for me and hopefully for others as well. So that's how I got to OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. And up to now, I'm still using uh, rolling release OpenSUSE Tumbleweed for uh, things like some of my workstations, some of my server-like machines and I'm quite quite happy with that. It's worked so far pretty fine for me and it's been several years since I'm doing it, like six or seven actually I would say. And uh, this brings me to what is the advantage of a uh, rolling release. Why would someone be interested in having a rolling release distribution on their workstation, Raspberry Pi or server or whatever? That's, as I mentioned, uh, very often and uh, nowadays it's, I would say, getting more and more pressing that uh, you sometimes really need the latest tool chain to have the latest cool software running. You need latest compilers, you need latest libraries and so on. And trying to make, uh, make things work on uh, stable long-term supported distributions, uh, it can be very tricky. Like. Uh, I would say that uh, some of the companies that are behind this event and even behind my employment are making a lot of money from supporting old uh, long-term releases. However, it's still, I'm very aware that, we are all aware that it's, it can be very tricky to have latest stuff running on uh, old, uh, old releases. And that's why you can, as an alternative, you can switch to some rolling release when everything will be will be latest and coolest. It, of course, brings some issues on its own, like uh, some of the stuff is not really following the development. So if there is a new compiler and you will encounter some new, more strict checks. You have to deal with it somehow. Well, not you as a user, but usually someone who is uh, behind the distribution. And of course, uh, it can happen that some of the software will not really work, but that's again, in the long run, it's an advantage that you can uh, that you can actually report uh, bugs early to the upstream developers and ask them to fix them before the other distributions hit the same issue. Which also brings me to some like uh, basically a story. Of a friend of mine is working at a company that is uh, streaming uh, s uh, streaming videos, something like Netflix, but not Netflix. And he was dealing with the issue that they were in encoding some of the content on some high performance workers and they were running them again on some stable Debian. I'm sorry to Debian users here if I don't want, don't want to bash Debian, but it's like a good example of a conservative distribution. And they were, of course, they were interested in encoding it with latest FFmpeg and they preferably wanted to have the FFmpeg as as much optimized for the hardware they were using as possible. And it was a pretty tricky with the old, oldish Debian. So they ended up uh, having to rebuild GCC to, to build uh, their customized FFmpeg binary for their spe specific payload. And when we were talking, I was asking, why, why are you not using something that is not like 10 years old? Like, if, wouldn't it be easier? And and uh, I think that they upgraded to later Debian. They still haven't switched to rolling release, but uh, they are on their way to using something like this because, it, in, for example, in this case, uh, in this scenario, when you are uh, anyways doing a lot of development on your own, having the latest environment uh, and is 
quite a big advantage. And you are also not in a position of like a conservative company with a relatively limited manpower that just wants to pay someone for the support and don't deal with it. You have plenty of people in house that are able to deal with issues, but just don't want to be. You don't want to have your hands tied behind your back by using using old stuff. So that would be one example when using of a rolling release can be can be beneficial not only to the end user enthusiast that wants to use bleeding edge, but uh, but who wants to really have latest stuff because they really need it. That being said, uh, what is specific about uh, open source Tumbleweed from other rolling releases? Obviously, I would assume that plenty of you know or have some experience with Arch Linux and maybe even with Gen 2. And there are uh, other rolling releases. What is uh, specific for uh, for open source is that we are kind of proud of our quality assurance that is done via means of open QA which will be discussed later by Chris and even it has a special talk uh, even later by, by Dan, who is here in the audience as well. And we are building everything in our own build system, open build service, which I will also cover a bit later. However, what is, uh, what is important about this is the quality. As I've said, I'm using open source Tumbleweed uh, in a lot of spaces. What I can say is that it happened to me like once a year that I had some issues that I had to manually solve and like search for what to, what to do with them. And I think that in most cases it was uh, like some hardware driver specific things that maybe were, if I recall the last thing, it was something with GPU and uh, the easiest solution was to just roll back to the previous or just boot using the previous previous uh, previous kernel so that's like uh, not like something and uh, most of uh, my colleagues even at work are using open source tumbleweed nowadays and they are able to work like 99.9 percent of the times they are if they are delayed they are not delayed because they are using tumbleweed but because of something else so so that's uh, that's just a very brief and generic introduction to what a rolling release is and what is open source Tumbleweed. But what I would like to do now is to ask our audience if they want to share something or if they have some comments about rolling releases, some experiences, positive, negative, or if they just have some questions and whatever, just please, please speak up. If somebody's I'm not so comfortable with speaking up, you can use the Q&A. We can read it. Or just the chat, like Luna did. And yep. that was uh, <laughs> Archon, four there. computers. Wow. You have, a, you have either a lot of time or you're very good with Arch Linux. I used to run Arch back in the day, and oh boy, <laughs> it broke every few months. So I stopped. But as I also wrote in the chat, uh, you tend to learn a lot from Arc Linux. So one thing that's definitely superb about that destroys the documentation. Ah, uh, yeah. Jan has yeah. one concern, right? Uh, who wants to respond? This is a very common complaint. I don't think it's a concern. It's not a concern. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't look like <laughs> that's that. That's not a concern. The I, hear it, gigantic. I hear it on yeah, every okay. meeting, guys. Like, yeah. Right. yeah, he even confirmed it himself. So, I mean, yeah, the updates are gigantic, but they never crash. And that's partially also thanks to OpenQA because broken snapshots aren't published. If something breaks the installer, breaks the distro, it never reaches you, yeah, which kind of is the point of a gating pipeline. That's... Uh... Well, we are not uh, rolling as just uh, pushing the packages as they are uploaded, but we are more like releasing snapshots, but pretty often. So in the snapshots, when they are released, they are always tested by OpenQA. So they really should work in at least basic scenarios, but we can later look at the OpenQA coverage as well. 
So that's uh, that's an interesting. Sometimes open source Tumble heat releases like a huge uh, huge updates that are often caused by triggered rebuilds, and they are usually triggered sometimes not even automatically, but sometimes manually because of uh, huge tool chain changes like uh, glibc on or compiler that it's considered to be better safe and just rebuild everything. And people are sometimes a bit surprised that they need to update 2000 packages. And once the snapshot is released, but it's usually not a problem unless you are, uh, unless you have a very bad network connection. So, yeah. So we have one comment from Luna about OpenQA. OpenQA is awesome. Even the other registrars are using it like Fedora and maybe in even Debian. So yeah, so I think that maybe we can we can uh, jump into open QA part. So if Chris is ready, so yeah, we can start. Yeah, so um, you could probably consider that a bit of a spoiler. I was prepared to um, mention a few examples of um, open QR, uh, QA, um, which is yeah, GNOME and also um, Debian are some more recent additions to the family. But um, yeah, let me start from um yeah what what is open qa so for those of you who don't know anything about it i'm going to give you a little metaphor to work with so it is a testing framework right um but think of a human tester what a human would do to um, find out if for example if um if the distro works, if um, software on it works, what would a human do? A human would go and um, install, for example, using a USB stick or some other means, and run the installer and start um, typing things and selecting things on the on the screen, and going through the installation process until they manage to install the system and then run their own applications. And now imagine OpenQA doing that in much the same way, except it's synthesized. So any of the input is, of course, sent through the backends. And mouse clicks and such are, are synthesized as well. And there's, in fact, a video stream that's, that's running that tells the um, the job, what it's what it's actually running. So rather than you know somebody looking at the screen, you can see that you know see as in um, record the, the video and find out if what's expected is actually going on or maybe something else is happening that you weren't expecting. And I'm going to show you on my screen let's see if screen sharing works still so i think you should be able to see um the open uh, qa um open qa web app yep and i'm not going to go massively into technical detail i'm going to keep it um at the at the base overview of course, if you have particular questions, um, feel free to ask at any time. And yeah, so the, the web app is um, probably one of the main ways that people interact with OpenQA. So what you can see here is an overview of the groups, um, um, which are certain um, distros of OpenQA that are set up in this instance. And you can get an overview of how many jobs passed or failed, for example. Or you can see, in some instance, um, what's still running. Because, of course, depending on the amount of hardware, you cannot run everything at the same time. So this is where the scheduling feature of OpenQA comes in as well. And let's maybe take a look at an example build. So um, you can already see there are some failures. So imagine as a, as a test reviewer, you'd be checking this to find out you know, the current state of it. Um, 
are all of the tests passing or um, if not, what might be the problems that are currently there and need to be verified manually. Um, so for example, um, this, is an, this is a job that passed. So this is of course the, the best case the jobs run through and you can see what's called the different test modules, such as for example, boot to desktop. This is a very simple example of um, you booting up the system. So imagine again, from the user perspective, you have your system installed and you're um, hitting the power button and you're looking at Grub for instance, and you can see that it offers you to run open to the tumbleweed and the test records this screenshot, or more specifically, it's called a needle in OpenQA, which tells us that this is working correctly. Because if this weren't showing up, it would suggest something is going wrong. And um, yeah, maybe to go a bit um, further, you can see this. Um, there's a few other tests going on. There's also some um, command line based tests. But maybe let's have a look at something more graphical. Um, I see there's some questions in the chat. Maybe we should check those. Yeah, we had one question from Sleepwalker, Volker, but it's more like general questions. So we can go back mm -hmm. to it later. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm going to look for an example of some maybe some some gnome examples and um yeah gnome shell being the the default when you install open to the tumble and read um here for instance you can see in the test that this is going through the full installation process as part of the test so this is um, also a case that's used a lot um and i'm, I'm just going to go by example you know the steps to show how it generally works. So you can see the, the screens you would go through. As a user, you can see you know, the installation process. And at every step, you can verify that the process works as you would expect from what a user would do as well. And you can even see the lovely, hi, this is OpenSUSE welcome screen, meaning, of course, that you successfully installed the system. Um, however, let's also take a look at something that didn't work well because, you know, this is ultimately where QA comes in. Um, you need to be prepared that something doesn't work. Um, eventually, things fail. So let's take an example. So here you can see that a LibreOffice test failed and um, it failed opening a file, apparently. So um, if we're looking at the test, you can see that there's a file picker there. And the test is, um, is sending the commands to open a file in LibreOffice. And if we um, go through it, you can see this is the current state of LibreOffice as it's um, being used there. I'm just using my keyword, by the way, to go through the um, sections, which is very nice. Um, I think OpenQA is quite nice to use with different input methods as well. Yeah, and now what happens? Um, it seems LibreOffice is gone, right? And this, in this instance, is a symptom of, um, of a failure. Um, and I'd say this is a, I'm not going to go into specifically why this happens, but this is a common case. Something happened and something causes the application to crash. Um, so you would notice in the, in the test that the next screens are not showing up that you would have expected to show up in the test. And um, yeah, maybe as, an, as another example, um, since OpenQA can also um, test command line applications. Um, here's an example of something that is not graphical at all. Let's see if this opens now. If 
unfortunately, it's a bit delayed now. Um, yeah, if, if there's any questions in the meantime, feel free to ask. Or, um, Actually, we have one question here in Q&A section. So Jan Mraz is asking, uh, so with that screenshot as something to check against in the test, similar tests could probably recognize resolution issues on some non-standard layouts, for example, white screens. Um, resolution issues. That's actually a rather tough one to crack, unfortunately. So OpenQA is uh, is by so the the common way to run OpenQA is in uh, is in a VM, and uh, it's it's uh, as far as I I know it is um, it's usually expecting to run in a 12, uh, 1280 times. 768 or something or 1024 resolution and if you do it some something else it tends to break which for instance the cubes os developers recently ran into so resolution detection isn't actually uh, as far as i know working that well you could test it but um, this is a little bit of a pain point Yeah, so I'm not not aware of specific um, cases for this sort of scenario. I would be interested though, like if you if you have a case something you want to test, um, I'd be interested to look into how to make that work. Um, yeah. Um, so this is this is an example in the meanwhile um, of of a test that is not graphical at all. So while OpenQA is especially good at um, doing things that require user input, um, this lovely example of a Rust test. So what this does is actually it um, provides the running system that say a developer might be using to set up a new project and call commands to install Rust packages using Cargo and such. If you don't know anything about Rust, that's not too important here, but this is just an example of something where you have the base system running and you have, for instance, proper networks ac access um, provided and you're able to, um, to run a command line application like you would expect. Um, and yeah, you can see in this instance that um, these these are just the, the console um, outputs here. I don't know how well you'd be able to read it through screen sharing, but you would see that it's actually typing cargo new, for instance, and showing the output from that. Um, yeah, another thing um, I'd like to show is um, since reviewing um, failures is quite important, um, we have some really good features in OpenQA, and this has been improved a lot over the last year um, to investigate failures. And it's aptly called the investigation tab. It's unfortunately a little bit slow at the moment. Um, um, yeah, I'm going to tell you anyway some of the basics this does. So um, you have a few means of, for instance, comparing if uh, previous runs um, failed in similar ways, so maybe pass to identify what kind of failure you're looking at, or if there's a new failure, or maybe there have been some changes to the test setup, or for instance, depending on the hardware you run tests on. So OpenQA can run tests on a lot of different types of devices. The very common case is, of course, QEMU. So there's a lot of virtual machines running. There's also bare metal. So, um, so you might have um, ARM servers, or you might have Spark or PowerPC, um, or whatever you um, need to test in particular. Might even just be a Raspberry Pi. So if you were looking to set up um, OpenQA, the baseline is actually quite low. 
And it could be as simple as installing OpenQA on your computer that you use for development. And what you need then is just one, um, one host, which runs the web app, the scheduler, and the database, which is what you're looking at here, and one worker, as it's called. So this is the part that runs the actual job and does the heavy lifting, and that later on reports back to the web UI what the result of the job run was. Um, just checking the, the clock. I guess we have another five minutes for this slot. Yeah, I yeah maybe. Sorry? Maybe since you since you mentioned the Raspberry Pi, um, if you are really quick, you can take a look. There should be bare metal tests running on a real Raspberry Pi somewhere in Guillaume Gardet's closet or desk. I don't know where he has his setup currently lying around. But uh, on Tumbleweed AR64, if you go to that job group. Um, oh, yeah, exactly. There should be, I, I think the juice uh if i think the juice tests there are some bare, actual bare metal tests these ones i guess Ooh, they're red yikes oh maybe uh, let's let's take a look at a passing one <laughs> um see this one yeah, I mean, if you, it, it should be visible via the via the variables, so it will not look any any different because the actual the only difference is that it really runs on a on a real Pi, but um, the connection is still via VNC, so there's no actual video recording in in there. That's what the Cubes guys are currently investigating. So I think if you check one, uh, if you check the test settings, you should be able to. Uh, there should be some general hardware settings or so. Uh, if if those are in there, then oh yeah, it's a general. Yeah. That's that's running on bare metal then. On a oh, very floor. nice. Yeah. So yeah, okay. okay. Uh, looks totally unimpressive, unfortunately but this is running on real hardware. So uh, this is, in my opinion, this is one of the big things that OpenQA can really do because it's not running in QEMU. This is running on a real Pi. If, the, if you have some incompatible U-boot or whatever you nowadays use to boot something off a Pi, if there's some incompatible change here, good luck finding that with QEMU. It's possible, but it's ugly. But if you test it on real hardware, if it breaks, it very likely breaks for everyone else as well. So plus one for gating. OK, so I don't see any questions in QA or in chat. So uh, is there anybody who has some question would like to share or some thoughts or anything? Because if not, we can move to the next part, which is a short introduction and discussion about OBS. Okay. I have a question. Can okay. OpenQA test other operating systems, not only Linux distributions? Oh, yes. That's a great question. Um, OpenQA can test um, a lot of stuff. Um, so. You can even test Windows on it, if you're so inclined. And there's actually Windows tests that are run in. This is for Lubosch. Exactly. <laughs> we actually do test WSL. Uh, and you know our open is a leap images in it. And that has to be tested in the Windows 10 VM or 11 nowadays. So yes, we do that. And it works. Thank you. And let me yeah. maybe take this one from the audience, whether OpenQA can test mobile Linux like the PinePhone, the Librem 5. So yes, in theory, you could test your PinePhone with that. Um, I've looked a teeny tiny bit into that, um, but it gets 
a little bit tricky. So one of the things is OpenQA wants to run, uh, first you want to run inputs into into your device. And with a Pine phone, it would be really great if you could actually type on it, which that gets really hairy. So emulating a touch screen via some, I don't know, mechanical fingers that's going to that's going to suck really hard so that's not going to be too easy and then you also have with these things a surprising issue and that is if you create a busted image and it hangs during booting you want to be able to kill it with a pc or a raspberry pi you have a rather simple way and that's uh, it's connected and you do that one this has a battery so you're going to wait for a few hours um and so there's you, you could make it run and i'd say if uh, if there's a distribution that's really committed to producing high quality uh, to continuously test it you can you can do it so you can uh, you can for instance uh, unscrew something like this connect a usb uh, connect an sd card multiplexer boot off the image and solder a few cables in there that you can really unplug uh, the power supply it's possible but it's a ton of work i would have comment on this as well in uh, most cases you actually don't need physical hardware i'm aware that uh, as uh, one of our uh, OpenQA developers was actually sort of cheating, cheating in some Android game by running Android image in QCow and just uh, playing the game by, via means of OpenQA. So as long as uh, you can uh, run whatever you are you want to test on the physical device in some QCow, you can test it actually pretty easily, I would say or actually cheat in the Android game or whatever you want to do. We have one question in chat here. Um, how does the needle matching work? How precise is it? Can two broken pixels break the whole test? Um, so I'd say the, the answer is no. Um, yeah, see, Dan's also commenting on the... Um, yeah, actually, if, if Santi is here, feel free to, to chime in. Um, otherwise, I'll try to answer this. So, ah, we have something. Bad news, Shanti. We, I can't hear you. I'm not sure about address. Uh, no. No, no, it's like super quiet. It's not the volume. It's the probably incorrect device. Just go to sound settings. And Just no open, open. You open your mouth, and I speak for you. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> uh, how about now? Now. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Cool. So. Uh, Long story I've, short, uh, throw in uh, a needle in case you want the visualization. Amazing, thank you. Uh, so, uh, because OpenQA, um, so it's basically a program that is only taking a look at whatever is on the screen. Um, the backend is using OpenCV, so there is an algorithm that is going to take a look at the image and is doing some uh, normalization operations. Uh, then it takes a look at a reference. So this is basically a JSON file with uh, X, Y coordinates, and then they can uh, they can be there can be multiple areas of something that we want to look at, something where we somewhere where where we don't want to look at, and then there are multiple operations that can be done over those areas. So. What OpenQA is going to do is it's going to look at the VNC, take a screenshot, and run it over a uh, over said algorithm in the backend. Uh, when this is when this is happening, it's taking out the difference. So it's going to look in that new screenshot, the reference, and then it says, okay, so here in this in this very small amount, there is the button. And let's say that we want to match hello. 
and everything is black and white. So there, because we have only black and white, you have the problem of what happens if somebody adds one pixel. And this is where it becomes tricky. So we have a match percentage. So when the image is basically kind of normalized, uh, you get a certain value that is then converted to from zero to 100%. And you can define at the moment of the creation of the needle, how big the, pills, the pixel difference can be from what you get in the screenshot to the, to the reference. And from their own OpenQA will tell you, yeah, this looks like more or less something similar. Uh, so let's say somebody decides to change black and white and inserts a gray. Then if you have a low tolerance, then OpenQA will say, yeah, uh, this looks okay. But if you are having a higher score, so you want to have uh, at least 90% of match, uh, OpenK will tell you like these are two different buttons. Mm -hmm. uh, it happens very often, for instance, that we are having text that is being changed from bold to uh, normal uh, to not bold, basically. Mm -hmm. And depending on on this matching level, we will have more tests failing than in other cases. But if More you updated fonts in general, right? It doesn't exactly be bold, yeah. 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 So thank yeah, you. If you want to make QA hate you, then change the default font. Yeah. Or wallpaper so, as we plan to, right? <laughs> all that. So we are slowly running out of time. So um, if you don't mind, I would switch to the last part of this uh, meetup, and that's uh, OBS. So uh, Martin, can, if you can start just some short intro to OBS, sure. and then we can have a discussion. Thanks. So basically what we are using at SUSE and OpenSUSE and some other projects as well is that we are, what we are doing is using open build service as a tool to build our packages on, and other things, not only packages, but uh, various container images, uh, ISO images for K, KVM and so on. It's in a very brief, brief description. And let me share you share screen and show you what actually what you can uh, build as in uh, if you are just interested in building packages in uh, in open build service. As a actually nice example is uh, the open build service is accessed uh, via either web UI or command line client or API, and the command line itself is somehow built in a uh, in project in OBS project is something that is like uh, imagine it as a directory containing packages so project is open to say tools and package is OSC open to say client and uh, this project is uh, quite a nice example of uh, what all we can build in open build service it has basically enabled every possible Linux distribution as a build target that it can build. So apart from uh, RPM-based distributions, which are built from OSP spec, spec file, or then uh, we have we are building for Debian-based distribution. We are building for uh, ARCH package management-based distributions, and we are also building for some. Uh, up images and we can also do some flat packs and so on. And up packs for Windows as well. Yeah, that's I, I did not know that actually. <laughs> that's how, we, how I learn. <laughs> but let's uh, just quickly scroll because it's the list is uh, um, too big to, to discuss everything. Like CentOS 6, well, CentOS 6 is failing. The beyond, the beyond, the beyond 6, well, it's already unresolvable because it's some new stuff, but uh, there is a plenty of uh, distribution build targets here available, and plenty of them have uh, a lot of targets enabled. Like for Magia 8, we are building for 32 bit Intel, 64 bit Intel, ARM v7L, and ARC64. So, a lot of Raspbian as well as a build target. 
I always learn about existence of uh, absolutely <laughs> obscure distributions from here because I I still don't know some of them. Like uh, well, Xubuntu, I think it's not no longer relevant, but yeah, but there are like uh, weird, strange distribution. Uh, Open Euler 2003. I have no idea what this is, but I'm not sure if I want to know what it is actually. What we can uh, build in Open Build Service is not only the images and containers, but we are building like uh, ISO images for the distribution. Like when Open uh, Open SUSE Tumbleweed rolling release is created, it's also like uh, from packages uh, the ISO image is created. The ISO image is usually the thing that is passed to OpenQA for testing. So OpenQA usually works with, uh, with an ISO image and it just goes through some installation or some, there are some other scenarios, but for the sake of time, let's, let's, let's assume that, that this is more advanced topics. So yeah, but uh, we can build like uh, ISO images, KVM images, uh, open container images, uh, lots, lots of stuff. We have like uh, JOS, this is like a just enough OS image, which should be building uh, building just the KVM images for various various uh, ARM flavors like yeah it just creates a raw image which is supposed to be copied to the to the boot media and and so on so we can do a uh, plenty of things in open build service apart from building for various distribution as you could have already seen is uh, we can also build for various architectures by default or by the most common use case is that for various architectures we actually have a physical workers that are doing the doing the building so like for uh, x86 64 obviously we have an intel machine for power pc 64 little endian we have a power pc 64 little endian for arm we have arm workers and uh, in most uh, common scenario on these workers is that we are running build inside of the KVM environment. The open build service can also work with system D and spawn. Uh, I think that there was some experimental support for Docker. It can also run in change root environment. It can also run uh, build in a QEMU environment. So you can actually build for other architectures that for architectures that you physically don't have access to which is pretty good for support for uh, adding support for a new distribution or new architectures to your distribution like uh, we have some experimental building for uh, risk 5 in uh, in open build service as well we also had some uh, experimental support but it was more like a pet project of one of our colleagues uh, that we were building uh, open to set tumbleweed or attempt to build open to set tumbleweed for m68k i hope i'm pronouncing the architecture correctly but this is the old old cisc architecture that mac computers used to run 25 years ago and it's, it's uh, the hardware is still manufactured but uh, it's uh, not really powerful and usually people don't don't run a linux distribution a generic linux distribution on it but you can Find it. And uh, so th this is something that we, all of this can be done in open build service. If you would be interested in, uh, in deploying open build service, the open build service actually has a fairly, fairly good documentation. It has its own project pages, open build service. And if you want to have uh, just a, very trivial setup you can just download the installer for the appliance obviously it will not uh, create you the huge build environment like we have in the build open .org, but if you want to play with build service you can do it via this way we have also extensive documentation for the build service available as well in html and you can learn how to add uh, support for uh, support build receipts and package formats what is supported how to set up various things in the environment and so on or if you don't want to install uh, open build service and uh, go through the configuration and setup and importing the packages to bootstrap a build target and so on 
you can uh, just uh, simply use uh, the publicly available open source one like the the one i've been showing to you the the build open source org let me share it again where uh, everybody is free to create uh, free to create an account and create your own project and set up your own build targets there is as you can see in the osc example there is a plenty of available targets if you would want to build for some distribution that is not yet available but it's some build uh, kind or type that is supported in general by by build by open build service you can just uh, ask uh, you can just ask the build service developers or maintainers to just import the distribution for you as well that's something that can be done as well and you can just uh, create your own project or ask for a, your project to be created and you will get something like a working directory or workspace where you can where you can play with your software so we have like a here for uh, for GNU Held, which is a set of packages for uh, basically monitoring of health things. It's like uh, something that you can see at your doctors when they are entering your diagnosis into computer. We have like special projects here set up that are sub projects that contain all the necessary packages and uh, they are maintained there. Sometimes uh, the the upstream uh, developers are using actually public build open source org to verify or to, to build the packages for them for uh, the things that they are they are creating. So if you are interested in any of this, you can you can just go to build open source org and uh, and try it in in some in some uh, environment that you just create for yourself. Let's see, there is like a arch core, but it's in import. Uh, let's see if there is some nice cloud development. There is some interesting example, discontinue distributions. And basically when the distribution as a build target is imported, it appears as one of the projects in build service. There is no some, not much magic behind it. Some KD test projects for, uh, for KD testing and so on. Martin, yeah. can I mention one thing? Yeah. We have four, four more minutes. I maybe you've said it because I had to reconnect and uh, because of bad connection. But you know, imagine that you just want to rebuild your own tweak of the image, so it's super easy to fork the package or the entire project, and you can just do small modification and rebuild the image by yourself, which is pretty cool. It takes just a few clicks. Yeah, and there are actually people that are doing this. There are some uh, derivatives of open source being created in build service. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah, and there is also there was some uh, some person that was creating. It was like Hackers Sans Frontiers, and he was creating some custom images of uh, of open source tumbleweed for uh, that contained some stuff that was basically like uh, privacy oriented. Uh, and some somehow tweaked so basically it was for people in the countries that are not so fortunate as our country is or the country that I am that have to connect to connect to some to the Wikipedia through Tor and stuff like this so that, that, that's uh, that can be done there as well and I think that as a starting point what uh, Anybody who wants to do it is just uh, look at the open source tumbleweed and start with the QV descriptions there and just tweak them according to their their needs. And uh, yeah, it, it, it's actually, sh I, I have to admit that I've never tried it because I never felt the need to do this, but it should not be that difficult. It's really quite, quite straightforward. Good example is you receive some obscure hardware like uh, you know new ARM-based laptop that may not work out of the box, and you want to play with like the latest kernel and do some you know out of three patches. That's exactly perfect for this. Yeah. So and basically that's for uh, the basic introduction of the open build service. There is plenty of things that we haven't covered yet, of course due to time constraints. 
but if you have some questions, comment, ideas, complaints, feel free to to use the remaining couple of minutes and and ask them. Q and A has a question from Jan Mraz, but I feel like this was maybe answered. Can you double check? Uh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So we have only one minute, so maybe uh, we can just, um, if you have any questions, feel free to join us in the work adventure uh, instance. We will be there and we can answer your questions. Keep in mind that there is a limit of four people, so we have to, maybe we should stand a little bit further from each other and, you know, so we can actually okay, ask. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I, I think that um, we can move to work adventure. So thank you everybody for uh, sharing uh, your wisdom here and for all questions. And that's all from us. So thank you and have a nice day. Bye. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye bye. 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 Okay. Thank you all. Thank you to all speakers, to all the people <laughs> participating.